Cyclic groups are such happy groups because as we're coming to understand, all of their properties can be explained by analogous properties enjoyed either by addition of integers or addition modulo n of equivalence classes of integers. So because cyclic groups have so much nice properties, um, it turns out we're going to want to use them as obvious places to look for the building blocks of larger and more complicated groups. In our last video, in particular, we convinced ourselves that every cyclic group, among other things, all of the elements in that group, their order is a divisor of the order of the group. So I can't have any element in a cyclic group, the order of whom does not divide the order of the group itself. And what we want to do now is take the step from talking about orders of elements to talking about subgroups of cyclic groups, because they have a lot to do with one another, as it turns out. We'll prove this theorem, which is a direct analog of the theorem that we just proved about the orders of elements. And the theorem is that if I have a cyclic group G, let's say its order is N, so it's a finite cyclic group, and if I have any divisor K of N, then the theorem says there exists a subgroup H whose order is K. For example, if I have a cyclic group of order 20, then there exists a subgroup of that group whose order is 10. There exists a subgroup whose order is 5, a subgroup whose order is 2, a subgroup whose order is 4. Um, so this is pretty powerful. It gives us a, a real a whole grab bag full of subgroups, potentially. For every divisor of the order of the group, we can find a subgroup that has that divisor as the order of the subgroup. So how should we prove this? Again, we have here a cyclic group, by assumption, and it's a finite cyclic group. N here, by assumption, is a finite integer. So what do I do in my mental, my cartoon bubble for a finite cyclic group? I think about a clock. So over here on my, on my cocktail napkin from the Hilbert Hotel, uh, that guy grabbed this at the bar, great place to stay. There are always vacancies. Um, I'm just going to sort of draw out a clock. And maybe let's make it a real clock. So I actually have 12 points around my clock. Um, so this clock, then, is a model for the additive group of integers mod 12. Let's see if I can come up with a rationale for why this statement here in the theorem should be true. So the statement says, let's choose a divisor of the order of my group. So if my group is order 12, let's say I choose 4 as one of my divisors. 4 is a divisor of 12 because 4 times something is equal to 12. 4 times some whole number is equal to 12. That whole number, the cofactor, is 3. So I'm just going to write down here, 4 times 3 is equal to 12. That's how I know that 4 divides 12. And so then the question is, within this group of integers with addition mod 12, how do I find a subgroup whose order is equal to the divisor that I chose? How do I find an order 4 subgroup inside of my clock? So to do that, let me just think about what would happen, rewriting 12 at the top of my clock as 0, so it's in the same equivalence class mod 12, that's my identity element. If I'm looking for a subgroup of order 4, I wonder if I could do that by finding an element in this group that has order 4. We know that that's possible because in a cyclic group the order of any element is also a divisor of the order of the group, as our fact on the previous slide showed. So if I can find an element of order 4, then it should generate a subgroup of order 4, if I look at all of its powers. Where am I going to find an element of order 4? Well, the secret here is I can find it by taking the cofactor of 4, 3 in this case, and just adding 1 to itself, my generator, to itself that many times. And when I've arrived at 3 o'clock on my clock, I'm going to take that as my next element. So one element in my subgroup is 0, the next element in my subgroup is 3. Since my subgroup has to be closed under addition, 3 plus 3 also has to be an element, so I'm going to go three more spaces along. 6 is going to be the next element. 6 plus 3, again by closure, has to be an element in my subgroup. And then 9 plus 3 actually gets me back to the identity, because 0 and 12 are the same thing in the residue classes of integers mod 12. And so I have this subset of four elements, 0, 3, 6, and 9, their equivalence classes mod 12. And that subset we can show forms a subgroup. Check it. It's in fact exactly the subgroup that's generated by the element 3. And the clue here to the scratch work that I've done on the back of this napkin is that we ended up choosing as my generator exactly that thing which was the cofactor of k 
that shows that k is a divisor of n. So that 3 in this equation here accounts for this 3, which is the generator of the subgroup whose order is exactly what I wanted it to be. So the generator of h is 3, and the, uh, the order of the subgroup is 4. So let's turn this into a proof. Let's try to generalize it. So let's assume that g is a cyclic group, and we're going to call its generator a, because we have to call it something for the sake of our proof. What's the analog over here on my clock? What would have been a generator, or a natural generator, for z mod 12 for my regular clock? Well, the number 1, or the residue class of 1, mod 12, is a generator for this group. And so the role of a, the generator, is played by 1 on my clock. And another way to think about that, again, as we've been talking about, is that the structure of cyclic groups is explained by the properties of integers, either integers themselves or residue classes of integers mod n, where those integers are playing the roles of the exponents on my generator. So the role of 1 is played by a, so on my clock I'm going to think of this 1 as a to the power 1, and 2 as a to the power 2, a to the power 3, and so forth and so forth. That's really what's happening when we say that a cyclic group is the same as z mod 12, is we're making the comparison from the generator to the number 1, which is a generator of that cyclic group of residue classes mod 12. So this is really what my clock picture looks like, is I really just have the various powers of A arrayed around this clock. And so, thinking more abstractly about this example on my napkin, the generator that I really wanted was not necessarily 3, but really the third power of A. Right? That third power of A is going to generate the sixth power, the ninth power, and then the twelfth power, which is the same as the zeroth. So that suggests the following. First of all, we know from the previous uh, set of facts about cyclic groups, the order of A is equal to n. Right? The order of my generator is equal to the number of elements in my group by a previous result. Now we're going to pick up an arbitrary divisor of n. In this example it was 4, but again in the general case we just have to call it k because the universe is picking it, not us. That has to be true because this is a implicitly here a universal claim for all k which divide n. So if k is an arbitrary divisor of n, then we're going to write this magic boxed equation down here. By definition of divisor, we can find the cofactor, that there exists a cofactor m, such that k times m is equal to n. Right? So this thing is the equation which tells us the reason why k is a divisor of n. And it also gives us this cofactor m, which in our example on the napkin was a pretty important element uh, to figuring out how to construct our subgroup. And we're going to write what we call a constructive proof. It's a constructive proof because we're going to tell the reader exactly how to make the subgroup H. We're not just going to show that it exists, but we're going to show specifically how it can be made, how it can be constructed. And we'll construct it in direct analog to how we constructed this one. We took A, uh, H rather, to be the subgroup generated by this element, which was 3 on my original clock, what I'm now to think of as A to the power 3, since we're now thinking of the generator as being A. But the role of 3 is really just the role of the cofactor of the k, and so that role should be played in my proof by m. So I'm using my specific example to motivate my more general argument, and hopefully it still works. So we're going to define h to be the set of all powers of a to the m. On my original clock, it was a set of all multiples of 3. Then it became the set of all uh, powers of a to the power 3. In my proof, that's a to the power m, because the role of 3 is being played by m. Now all we have to do is check that the order of this subgroup is what we claim it to be, namely the order of this subgroup needs to be k. Well, why is that the case? Well, the order of any cyclic group is the same thing as the order of its generator. That is, an, again, another fact that we knew from before. And so it's going to be the same as the order of the element a to the m. Now, the order of a to the m is less than or equal to k for sure, because if I take the kth power of this element, that's a to the m to the k, but m times k is equal to n by assumption and by the commutative property of multiplication of integers. And since the order of a is n, this is equal to the identity. Therefore, the m times kth power of, uh, of a, which is the same as the kth power of a to the m, is the identity. And so the order of this element can be no more than k. But it also can be no less than k. Because again, making the argument about the smaller powers all of those smaller powers, 
uh, if j is less than k, then the mj is going to be less than mk, which is equal to n. And each of these, mj and mk, are going to be powers of, of a that are less than n. And all the powers between 0 and n, 0 and n minus 1 inclusive, uh, of the generator are distinct one from another. Therefore, the order of a to the m is greater than or equal to k. Since both are true, we conclude the order of a to the m is equal to the order of uh, h, which is equal to k. So we've constructed a subgroup of order k. All we had to do was make the argument that taking the mth power, m being the cofactor that shows why k is a factor of n, taking the mth power of the generator of g will generate a subgroup whose order is k. So this is super duper powerful. It tells me not only do I have elements in a cyclic group whose order are divisors of the order of the group, but I also have subgroups inside of my cyclic group whose orders are divisors of the order of the full group. You might ask yourself, is the converse of this statement true? And by converse, what I mean is the statement that reads as follows. Is it true that every subgroup inside of my cyclic group has its order equal to a factor of n? Could I possibly find, for example, inside of a cyclic group of order 20, could I find a subgroup of order 15? Even if that subgroup were not cyclic, if I can't construct it in the same way I constructed this one, could I construct it in some other way? That's a question we won't answer in this video. We might also ask the question, how important was it in this theorem that G be a cyclic group? What if G were not a cyclic group? What if it were maybe some other abelian group that's not cyclic? What if it were some non-abelian group? Can we still make the claim that the order of a subgroup has to be a divisor of the order of the full group. So must G always have a subgroup uh, of every divisor's order in the case where G is not cyclic? That's another question that we're not going to answer in this video. But the true power of this theorem is actually, I think, found in its contrapositive. So the contrapositive framing of this would be the statement that if I have a group of order n, and if I pick a divisor of n, let's call it k, if I can show that G does not have a subgroup of order K, so if it's missing a subgroup of one of its divisors' orders, then according to this theorem, that means that G is not cyclic. So this gives me a nice powerful tool to prove that a group is not cyclic. For example, if you hand me a group of order 40, and I can look inside of that group and say, well, this group doesn't have any subgroup of order 10, then according to this theorem, that must mean that the group you handed me is not a cyclic group. So in its contrapositive, this is also a really useful theorem to be able to tell when a group is not cyclic.